Okay, hi. So let's start tutorial seven. Today we're going to talk about deep reinforcement learning, which you should have already watched in the video lectures. Right, so specifically we'll cover kind of a theory reminders about the setting of reinforcement learning. We'll show a very cool and very useful framework for doing RL uh, called OpenAI Gym, and then we'll use OpenAI Gym to um, apply it to the problem of uh, deep Q learning for uh, Atari games. All right, so let's start. Okay, first we have to remind ourselves a bit about reinforcement learning. So we're gonna th th this theory part will be a bit longer than usual because uh, it, it's very relevant to the model that we're gonna implement. It's gonna actually be exactly based on this. So first of all, in the setting of reinforcement learning, we, we have the following components. Usually we have a, an agent that can perform some actions A on the environment. The environment has some internal state that the agent can't necessarily see in, in, in general, but he can see some observations of the environment representing some part of its state, and he gets reward for the actions that he performs. So basically, these are the, the components of, uh, of the re reinforcement learning problem. Okay. So just a quick example that we're going to see. In a, in a video game setting, our agent will be either a human or AI player, and he can perform a set of actions on the game. The actions are very specific. They depend on the game. The environment in, in total is the internal state of the game, perhaps other players that he can't control, perhaps things that can't go over, over the network. It can be potentially anything, but the agent only observes specific observations that the environment gives him, and he gets a reward from the environment, which in the case of a game might be the score or some kind of measure of uh, how well you're playing. Okay, so. We have seen supervised learning and unsupervised learning, where the difference was in supervised learning, we trained on some set of, uh, of labeled data. In unsupervised learning, we tried to infer the structure of the data, for example, infer some kind of latent manifold that the data is actually on and not in the whole um, space. But the, the RL setting is a bit different. It's a, it's a different paradigm. It doesn't clearly map I, I, onto either of these because we don't have any predefined labels. We're just interacting with our environment. But we're not completely blind. We have a, a reward system. We, we do get some feedback on the actions that we do on the environment as an agent. So by using these rewards or this feedback from the environment, we, we're trying to learn. So essentially, we're creating some kind of labels from our interactions with the environment instead of having them as part of our data set. Okay, but, but there are some unique challenges in RL. Specifically, um, the, main, the main ones kind of that we already talked about are the fact that our observations are heavily correlated with each other. With each other. Since we're acting on the environment and we're getting observations, then the, the observation that I see now heavily depends on what I did so far. So we're, we're having a strong correlations. If, if we're not playing very efficiently, we might have only completely non-useful observations. And this brings us to the exploration versus exploitation trade-off. So we, we, might, we might not be able to play right now, so we need to try to discover better ways to play by maybe foregoing what we think is good right now, so we can discover better strategies. And um, even more challenging is the fact that we, we don't necessarily get a reward every time. If, if you think about, for example, the game of, of chess, then you might only get a reward at the end. You might play lots of, lots of moves and then Finally, you, you get some kind of reward that says if you won, but you need to somehow infer the, the relationship between all the moves that were performed and the fact that the reward might be very delayed in this setting. Okay, so now to continue our, our reminders, let's talk about a bit about Markov processes, which form basically the, base, the basis of the framework for RL. So a Markov process or also called a Markov chain sometimes, <coughs> is a system that has a finite number of states. And 
transition probabilities between them. They have to be time invariant. And the, the crucial property of Markov chains is that the pro probability to transition to the next state only depends on the current state, not on any kind of, doesn't matter how we got to the state. When we're at a, at a specific state, we have uh, transition probability to the next state. So we have this uh, transition matrix that is the probability to transition from state i to state j. So given, given that we're, we are at time step t in, in state si, we, we have some probability to transition to state j. Okay, and some states may be terminal. It means that for any other state, you have no probability to get there from the terminal state. So that's just generally a Markov process. A Markov reward process is when you add, additionally to the Markov process, you add uh, an immediate reward that you gain by transitioning from state to state. Okay, and you also add this discount factor gamma, which you'll see what it's used for here. So once you have these rewards but for, for the transitions, then you can calculate the, the gain at time t, or the total discounted reward, which means you, you sum over future rewards from time t, from actually time t plus 1 into the future, and discount every step by gamma, which is our discount factor. So this gives you a Markov reward process. And you can create, with this, you can, give a, you can assign a value to each state, which is just the expected gain or expected reward. So think about it that the expectation here is over the states. Okay, so now we're saying given that we're starting from state S, this is our given, this expectation will be over all future states that we can transition according to the transition probabilities. That's a stochastic element here. So we, we might transition to some other state, and from there to some other state, and from there to some other state, each time we get a different immediate reward, and we're, we're discounting that with gamma. So this expectation is over all the states that are caused by the transition probabilities. Until either you reach a terminal state, so then the sum will end, or you might go on forever, but, but if gamma is not 1, then you'll get some value. Okay, so each state has a value assigned to it. Now a Markov decision process, which is actually what we care about, is when you take a Markov reward process and in addition you add the fact that you have actions that you can perform, not just, it's, it's not just um, a probability tr transition, now you, you decide what action you want to perform. So at each state we can perform actions from this action space. And now the transition probabilities will be action dependent. So if you perform an action, it doesn't deterministically determine what state you will end up in, you still have a probability distribution, but now it's, it's dependent on the action. So given a specific action and you start at a specific state, you have some probability to end up at other states. Okay. And we also now define the immediate reward like this. We say it's, it's the reward that you get if you are at state ST at time and perform action, uh, specific action A. It's not time dependent, this is just uh, showing that at, at a specific time, I'm in a specific state, performing a specific action, and I get a specific reward. Okay. Okay, next thing we need, to, we need to define is what the policy is. So now that we can perform actions, we define this policy function, or it's actually a conditional probability. It's the probability that will select action A at a specific state, S. Okay, so this basically determines what your agent will do. The policy is, is how, he will, how he will behave. When he reaches a state S, he has some, condi some conditional probability over the, the action space. Okay. So now that we have this policy, we can define the state value okay, of, of the M MDP by adding the policy. So it's, it's again, it's the expected value of the gain starting from state S, but also given the policy. And it's the kind of the same expression. And you can see that it, it, it breaks up. You can uh, really define it by the, the reward that you're going to get uh, immediately and the discounted future state, discounted state of the next state, okay, discounted value of the next state. Both, both of these have to be in the expectation because you don't know what the action will be performed. 
So let's just, to clarify, the, the state value is the expected immediate return. But again, it's expected because you don't know which, which action will be selected, so it's expected. Plus the expected discount, it's discounted value of the next state, which is also expected because you don't know what it will be. So both of these things are in the expectation. Okay. So if you, if you kind of write it explicitly, open the expectation that you, you'll see you, you have, uh, you have the, this first term, which is the, the expectation over the immediate return. Since you don't know the, the action, then you have to use the policy to go over all possible actions. And discounted, you have uh, expectation over both the action and the next state. Okay, And you're using the value of the next state. So graphically, you can see that the expectation here is if you write a state S, you have to ex do the expectation over the possible actions. And then each action gives you another thing that you have to do the expectation over, which is the state that you might, you might end up in following that action. Okay. So just as an example, here's an MDP with uh, some, some values for each state computed by a non-optimal state value function. The, the policy here just says with uh, probability one half, select each action. So you can see each state here has uh, two actions that you can do in the state. This is a kind of a student MDP. So he can either study. In some state, he might go on Facebook. Um, if, if he's in this state, he might choose the action, go to the pub in which case he gets a plus one reward, but then he might end up, this is an action, so he might end up with probability 0.4 back in this state, or he might get to either of these states. Okay, and this is a terminal state. So you can see, for example, intuitively, the value of this last state is high. Okay, because if, you, if you're here, you're expecting a pretty high reward, because you, you either take the reward 10 and get to this terminal state, or you might... You might leave the state, but you have a good chance of coming back. So it's kind of higher. And you can try to calculate it by hand, and you can see that given these other state values, you can really easily, with the formula, get to this value. Okay, so now, again, let's move to the thing that we actually care about. So similarly to the, value, to the state value function, we can define an action value function. OK, so this is really similar. The only difference is that we, we're also adding this action here that we are given in our expectation. So we're saying this is the expe expected future gain given we're starting at a specific state and doing a specific action, and we have a policy. OK, so it's exactly the same thing. But, the, but now what, what will happen is that this part is no longer stochastic since we're given the immediate action. So we only have an expectation over this part. And again, the expectation will be over both the states and the actions. See that? So now our action value function, okay, which given a state and an action tells us how valuable that is, is the immediate reward that we will get by doing that action in that state. This is a deterministic term. And this discounted future term, which says First of all, let's do the expectation over the next states under the action A. So this is our deterministic action. And then we have, we have the future action. That This is the action that we'll take in the next state. So we have to add, do the expectation over that. So graphically, you can see we're starting at some point where we have a state and an action. This action might lead to two, for example, in this case, two other possible future states. And then we have these also possible future actions. So we have to do the expectation over this part. Okay, so that's the difference. And we really care about this Q function because that's what we're going to learn. OK. So um, an interesting thing to, to notice about these uh, functions that I think in the lecture, um, Alex showed it as the Bellman operator, that if you, if you have some, um, value some action value or state value function, you can uh, replace the expectation over the actions with a maximum action. Just You have some, some value function. If you just, instead of doing this expectation, select the, 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 function that will, the action that will give you the maximal value, you get a slightly better action value function. And taking that to, the conc to its conclusion, 
you have this Bellman optimality equation, which says that if you have the optimal action value function, it has to satisfy this equation, which means, as you can see, you're taking the maximum um, value, taking the, the action that gives you the maximum value, okay? instead of expect, expectation over the actions. Okay, so this is the, the equation that we're going to use in our actual learning model. We're going to use that because given some state, act, some action value function, we're going we're gonna, to uh, learn an, a better one by using uh, the Bellman optimality equation or specifically the Bellman operator that Alex uh, showed in the lecture. Okay? Now, if we have some state value function, Q, we can always, we can always define our, um, our policy by simply selecting the, the, the state that maximize, the action that maximizes the state value, the action value function. So this is what this is. So if we have, for example, an, an uh, optimal policy, then we can have an op optimal action value function, then we can have an optimal policy just by doing that. And generally, any action value function that we have, we can build a policy in this specific way, and that's what we're also going to do in, in our implementation. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so now... Note that in our, in our setting of reinforcement learning, as opposed to other settings, for example, control, we, we do not know the probability to transition from state to state, and we don't know how the reward will behave. We don't know what will happen when we do an action, what reward we will we'll receive. So we have to kind of learn both the, the rules of the game simultaneously with the action value function Q. We want to learn both of them. That's the challenge in our reinforcement learning setting. Okay, and the last thing I need to remind you of is what experiences and episodes are. So, just briefly, an experience is uh, this tuple of a current state, the current action that was performed in that state, the reward, the immediate reward that was incurred by that action in that state, and the state that was transitioned into. Okay? So, if, if my, my agent is doing is doing things in, in the environment, then he's, he's creating these tuples all the time because he's, he's in some state and selecting some action, he's getting a reward, and he's transitioning to a next state. So we have these tuples. And an episode is, is a sequence of these experiences, of um, sequ sequential experiences, okay? So it's the experiences that, that uh, the agent, for example, had until he got the game over. Okay, so our episode will be some observation, action, reward, then a second observation, second action, second reward, and so on. And it's composed of multiple experiences. Okay. We also have a, the reward for the entire episode. It's just the accumulated reward that we got. Okay, that's it for the reminders. Let's talk about um, OpenAI Agent, which is our, frame, our framework that we're going to use. So basically, Jim is uh, defined as a general toolkit for developing and comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. And it um, actually comes with a very, very useful environment that you can play with. And um, it, will, it will provide us the, the environment part that we saw in the reinforcement learning. It provides our environment and we'll, we'll basically create our agent that will interact with it. Okay. So first we'll see a quick example of using Jim and then we'll dive into the example to understand exactly how to use it, and, th and then finally we'll implement a model based on that. So let's start with this. What we're going to see, see in the following is, uh, is uh, playing a classic Atari game called Space Invaders. So let's first of all play it using a completely random strategy and using Jim. Okay, so this is our, this is our code. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, use Jim to just create an environment. We specify here the name of the environment that we want. You can see on the website, the, they have lots of different environments, support all the, all the classic Atari games and many physics simulations and stuff like that. Okay, we also wrap our environment in a wrapper that we're gonna talk about soon, what these wrappers are doing. This will just allow us to create a video, a video of the gameplay so I can show you. Um, first, we're just gonna reset it to start a new episode. And 
here we have our agent code. So basically what we're doing is while the episode is not done, okay, the game is not over, we're choosing a random action using this action space property of the environment. We're choosing a random action and we're applying that action to the environment. We're doing that action. What we get back is the observation, the reward, whether it's a terminal state, whether the game is over, episode is done, and some extra info that I'll show you. Um, and then we just accumulate the road. So this is just to give you a small example of what's happening in gym. So I'm, I'm running that. It ran for uh, 393 steps, and I got a total re reward of 75. So how do we see what happened? Oh, wait, I, I just ran it again. So now the total reward is 30. I'm going to see it. So this is just a, a small piece of code that displays the, what the monitor wrapper recorded. You can use it if you need. Okay, so basically I just ran that uh, small example of a random action in gym and I get this nice uh, gameplay video. You can see my random action, my random agent is just moving and firing. And that's it. His three lives are up and you can see he got a re reward of 30. The score is 30, which is exactly what uh, was written here, I believe. Yeah, 30. Okay, so we just uh, used Jim to run a Atari game with a random agent. Nice. Okay, so you can see if you want to go to the, their website, they have uh, other really cool environments. Maybe I can just show you for a second. So yeah, you can see they have lots of Atari games, maybe all of them, and um, very, very, very cool uh, physics simulations that you can like train uh, agents to walk and stuff like that. Everything using the same framework. Once you write some code that uses this framework, it, it's just basically very, very little effort to move to a different setting just using this uh, framework. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay. Back to our tutorial. Also, you can implement your own if you have kind of a custom task. So it's useful to know. So let's just dive into the example a bit so you can understand the code later. First of all, what, what these environments are. Okay, so basically when you, when you have an environment, you, what you actually have is uh, some multiple environment in instances that are wrapping each other and modifying what you're getting out and putting into the environment. So let's just see that for a second. If you, if you take an environment and look at its documentation, try to enlarge that a bit. Um, first of all, you can see the actual instance type in this case, when I just uh, made an Atari game, is uh, called Time Limit. It's, it's, something, it's some kind of wrapper that's wrapping an Atari environment that's wrapping the Space Invaders environment. And you can see, for example, the main API methods are step that we use to, to do some action, reset, which we also saw. Okay, and um, has some, it defines some following properties like action space and observation space. So we saw that we use this. So this is the basic API of... Uh, of an environment, which each wrapper has to also implement. Okay, so now let's look at the observations. So if you if you reset your environment, you get some initial observation. But what what exactly is it? If you if you try to look at it, then you can see in this in this case of the Atari game, we have uh, something that looks like this. So kind of looks like an image, and indeed it's an image. So let's just uh, write some code that shows it. So I'm just uh, plotting it with imshow as an image. You can see, so this is the initial state of our Space Invaders Atari game, which shows you that really our agent is working with pixels directly. Okay, we're in, in, this, in the case of this environment, we're working directly with the screen pixels as a human would see them. Okay, this is our observation. It's just an image, just pixels. Okay, the space of possible observations which you can get from this environment is uh, you get some instance called box, you can see the dimensions of the image. So that just tells you that it's a, it's a space that represents an n-dimensional tensor with some uh, values in, the, in some range, which you can see what the range is. So in this case, I, I just took the range out. So I, basically, I have uh, images from 0 to 255 intensity levels in that shape. I can also sample, for example, a random observation. You can see this is our this is our entire space of observations. What we're actually seeing is frames from the game. Okay, so again, the environment might might have inner state, and 
It, it might give you observations from this space, but what you're actually seeing is what the game is producing. Okay, now, what actions can we perform using this environment in Jim? So we have also this action space property. Let's just quickly look at this. It's, uh, it's returning something called discrete. So this is uh, also a space that represents simply n discrete values. From, from the, in this case, from 0 to n minus 1. So we have discrete 6. We have six possible actions in the case of our Space Invaders game that we can do on the environment. Okay, so for example, the, the action 0 is in the space, but the action 6 is not. So it's 0 to 5. But what do they mean? Okay, so it, it really, it's game, it's game specific. Some games have more possible actions, some games have less. If you if you're in a different setting, which is not an Atari game, it, they might mean something else. And you also have sometimes actions that are not discrete, maybe a continuous action. But in this simple case, you can, specific, you can really get what they mean. So in the case of the Atari games, you can see, for example, the action in index 1 is fire. And then you have right, move right, move left. And then, I guess, right fire and left fire would probably do the same as fire. I'm not sure. So this is what our six different actions mean in this environment. Okay. So how do we perform actions? Let's see a small example. I'm just saying that I want to perform action number one, which we, now we know is fire. I'm running here for, for a fixed number of steps. I'm just doing the fire action in the environment. Okay, and, I'm, and I'm getting an observation, reward, and stop everything back. So I'm going to show you what I'm getting back. Let's just run that for a second. I want to see that I actually fired. It's kind of hard to see sometimes because there's a flickering effect. can't really see the fact that I fired in this frame. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, I don't know why it's not showing now. Sometimes you can't see the actual firing in the frame because it only shows it in every second frame. It kind of flickers in the, on the screen. But basically what I did here is just, I ran for a fixed number of, uh, of steps. I did the specific action and I got every time a reward. And also you can see the x-ray info what we got here. So for example, the x-ray info says, it tells us how, how many lives we, we already lost. So we're going to see that we're going to actually use that a bit later. Not for learning, but more to, to cut our episodes short. Because in this game, it keeps running even though, even if you die, you, you have more lives. So it keeps running until you ha you're running out of lives. And what we're going to do with our agent, we're going to stop. After you lose a life, we're going to stop and say that's an episode. Okay, so... Last chance to see the, f the actual firing. No. Ah, here you can see it. You can see the gray bar here. It shows that our, our agent actually fired just because I said fire action. OK. Let's go. Let's move on. OK. In the end, you have to close part of the API. OK, so let's talk about wrappers for, for a minute. So this is actually very, very, very useful when you have to work with uh, Jim. It allows you to wrap an environment instance. You're basically wrapping an environment with something that implements the whole environment API, so you can work with that wrapper instead of the environment. We, we have seen the monitor that we wrapped our, uh, our environment in, which allows you, for example, to write a video, to create capture video. But there are other uh, useful uh, wrappers. You have um, three types that are built in. You have these observation wrappers that allow you to uh, modify the observations that are coming out. So you can wrap your environment, modify the observation, then you, your agent gets a modified version. You have a re reward wrapper that does the same. You can, for example, clip the reward or scale the reward, whatever you want, before it gets to the, to the agent. And you have an action wrapper that allows you to, in the opposite direction, change the action that the agent is performing. Maybe you want to uh, add some randomness or something like that. And, What's nice is you can implement one of these wrappers and then just change the environment underneath. It doesn't matter. The same code that you wrote will work with any gym environment. So for example, here, just, just an, ex an example to, to show, you, show you some code. I uh, implemented a malfunction, malfunctioning screen wrapper, which just takes an observation pic of pixels that we saw and just uh, inverts the colors and adds some randomly, uh, randomly uh, sets uh, one of the channels. And I also implemented this uh, trigger happy wrapper, which, ra which uh, it, with a very high probability, just does fire instead of 
instead of kind of uh, any other action. So if I, if I instead of using my regular uh, gym environment, I wrap it with my wrappers here, and then use that, and then also wrapping it with a monitor just so we can see. And again, I have this uh, same random agent that just samples randomly from my action space. So let's run that. Now I got a 105 reward, which is nice with my random agents, and I get this kind of uh, modified version of uh, Space Invaders where I just change the, the colors and you can see the agent is not very moving very much, it's just mainly firing all the time. So you can kind of in use these wrappers to do lots of stuff. We're going to see it in our model, we're going to see all the pre-processing that we're going to do before learning is going to be based on these uh, wrappers. Okay. In the case of RLs, since you don't have a data set in advance, it's kind of hard to do any pre-processing in advance and then do the actual training. So you have to integrate your pre-processing in the pipeline of, of the actual game, for example. So here what we do, we, we wrap, wrap our environment, do what we need to do, for example, for pre-processing, and then the, the wrapped version will be what the agent will interact with after the pre-processing already happened. So in this case, he's interacting with kind of modified frames. Okay, so that was just an example. Now let's move on to the to the next part of the tutorial, which is uh, implementing uh, deep queue learning for these Atari games, based on what we saw so far. Okay, unless there's any questions so far. Okay. So what we're going to do? We're going to implement a queue learning method. Of course, since this is a deep learning course, we're going to use deep learning to, to implement the, the queue function. Um, and again, let's just stress the point that we're, we're working with pixels directly. We're teaching our, our agent to work with screen pixels, just like a human, but the, the, the only uh, kind of uh, relaxation we're doing is that we're getting the reward value from the environment. We're not having to read the pixels from the screen. So, we don't have to teach the agent to apply some convolutional network to read the, the score. The score will be given to him. But, but the whole game dynamics and everything that he needs to understand in order to build a, a better policy will be based only on the pixels. Okay, so this, this implementation that I'm going to show you is based on a paper from 2015 by uh, the DeepMind group at Google. It was a really good paper. And they really showed uh, superhuman results for almost all the Atari games in the same paper with the same model. So it was a really cool paper. And uh, it's also very similar to what Alex showed in the video lecture. So this is kind of uh, showing an implementation of the same thing. Okay, so the approach, first of all. What we're going to do, we're going to learn a parameterized function of the, again, action value function, Q. So given a state and then action, we want to know what its value is, or how good is it to be in that state and do that action. It will be parameterized by our um, model parameters theta. And we're going to treat it as a regression problem. So if you remember, when we saw examples of regression, then we usually had some kind of MSE loss between what our network outputs and our target number. So it will be very similar. And uh, of course, we'll collect experiences during training, which will we denote them like this. Okay, so again, this current state, current action, reward, and next state. Our loss here will be a pointwise MSE loss, since it's a regression. So given a specific, here I, I, our sample here is an experience. So again, experience now will be this is one sample for our model. This is our experience, tuple. So given one of those, we compute some target label Y. And our prediction is, our, is the, the Q value given by our model for the, the state and action that we're in that experience. And we will generate the label in the following way. If if the next state was terminal, if we reach the terminal state because of that action, we, we just get the reward. Our, our prediction is the reward. Otherwise, it's the re reward that we got plus the discounted maximal um, action value for the next state. So for the next state that we reached, 
we, we're taking the, the Q value of the maximal action. And if you recall what we saw previously, the Bellman equation, which looked like this, and you can see it's kind of very, very similar. And our label is actually specifically based on this equation, because if you remember, what we, what we said is that we can, given some Q function, we can generate a better Q function from it, kind of like a bootstrapping method. Okay, so we're, we're, basic, we're based on the Bellman equation, but we're dropping the, the expectation here over the next state. Okay, since we don't know it, and we assume that th this will be inherent anyway because we will see these experiences more. If, if an experience is more likely, then we'll have more samples of that experience, of that transition. So we kind of assume that, that these transition probabilities will be inherent anyway in our uh, model. Okay, so this is how we construct our labels for learning. And there's just a small nuance here, this minus, which I'll uh, talk about right now. Okay, so is, is that clear, this part? Okay. So one of the, one of the implementation details here in this paper was the fact that they, they use the what's called a target network. So a major problem with that, that definition is that it seems like we're using, we're using uh, the our own model to, to create our own labels. Okay, so we're creating a, we're, we're using the, the Q function for the next state and next action to update the current, the current ones. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a problem because if, if, uh, if, we, if we would actually do that, then it would, me, it would probably mean that our labels would be, would be similar to whatever the current network is updating. If you kind of think about it intuitively, why, why would it be similar? Because the, the state transitions are kind of smooth, especially in this kind of games. I mean, if you're in a specific state, you transition smoothly to other state. Maybe you move a little on the screen or you fire and you have, the next state has just a small difference from the current state. So if, if your convolutional network or any deep network is, is doing something on, on the current state and the next state is very, very similar, then you, you might get something that's not very useful, too similar. And also, in a, from a stability perspective, you, if, you, if you keep doing that, if you keep updating or creating labels based on your current model, then, then again, adjacent time steps will be also very similar. So you, you, you're going to influence the label for the next step. So you might create kind of a inherent instability in the training because you're creating these loops where you you update, the, you update your, your parameters, and then in the next state, you, you have completely different labels for maybe something very similar, just because you did an update. So you get these loops. So the, the way that they handled it in the paper is they had a different network for creating these labels with a different parameter. It's kind of the same architecture, but it has just different parameters. So these parameters are theta min minus, okay? And that way, the labels are not dependent on the actual model being trained. So if you look at the, the formulas, the, when, you, when you take the maximum of the action value for the next state, you do, you're doing it with a different parameterization. Okay, and more specifically, what you're doing is you're taking the parameters of your model, of a previous version of your model. So it's, it's exactly like bootstrapping. You're using a previous version of the model to learn the current version because of the, the kind of Bellman operator where you take some value function and you... You, you can improve over it by, taking, by doing this max operation, selecting the maximal action. So you're freezing some version of your model with these uh, theta min minus parameters, using that version of the model to generate labels and doing your learning. At some point, you will take your current model, make that the target model, and then keep going. So it's kind of bootstrapping, replacing, bootstrapping, replacing. Okay. That's the, the way they deal with, dealt with it in the paper. That's the concept of the target network. Next thing is uh, experience replay. So again, because this is a general problem with RL, we have these uh, non-IID samples because we're creating the samples based on our experience. So there's a very high correlation between this sample and the previous sample. And this creates various issues. For example, SGD assumes that you have IID samples. Because in SGD, instead of taking the gradient of the whole data set, you're taking gradients over batches. And then in the expectation, we say that 
it estimates the gradient that you would get for the whole, so it, for the whole data set. So this is a critical assumption that just won't, won't, won't be relevant in this case. And uh, moreover, it just, it might, again, make you stuck in these suboptimal loops. If you have a suboptimal policy and you only use that, then you, you might, you might uh, perform much worse than you could if you had uh, more diverse samples. So the, the solution in, in this paper, which is also common in, uh, in other cases, is this experience replay buffer, where we, we have a, a buffer of, of a pretty large number of uh, most recent experiences, but across different episodes. So you just play, play multiple episodes, you have experiences, you put them in the buffer. After the buffer is full, you throw away the, the oldest ones. So you have a most recent buffer. Of, of these experiences, and to update the model, instead of just taking the, the, the last few experiences, you're just randomly sampling from this buffer, which again might contain completely different episodes, completely different states than you're actually in right now when, while you're playing. So this makes the distribution of samples more uniform. Okay, and the uh, next, next thing that they did is uh, an epsilon greedy strategy for the agent. Okay, so the problem here is that initially, since your your Q function is completely random, then you're basically you might you might be playing very badly. And if we only collect those experiences, we might uh, never get any useful experiences. It might be even worse than just selecting at random because you might you might get a an, a network that just always always says that the maximal action is a no op, for example. So it might not be completely useful. So uh, the, the very simple way to overcome this is just say that our, action, our agent, instead of always doing what the, what the policy based on the Q, Q um, network is, it will, with some probability epsilon, take a random action. And with a probability of 1 minus epsilon, use the network to generate an action. And as the, as the training process progresses, we'll decay epsilon. So initially, we'll set it to 1, which means we do only random actions. We completely ignore the network. And as we progress, we'll start taking more and more non-random actions, but still, we'll not get it to 0. We'll still leave some probability of randomness for the exploitation versus exploration uh, trade-off. Okay, so sometimes we'll do random, random things anyway. Again, it's not, it's not, possibly it's not the optimal way to handle this trade-off, but it, it's one way, and that's what they did in the paper. Okay, and the last, last kind of uh, implementation detail here that we need to talk about before is the pre-processing pre part. So this is a r really strong case where the details really matter. In the, in the paper, they, they did a lot of pre-processing on the frames of the game and everything to really improve the training time and make it feasible. And also, they, they show that it, it, it really helps the model converge some of these things. So I'm gonna just, uh, I'll show you, I'll, I'll, this, this is a list of everything they did. I'm just gonna talk mainly about the visuals. So there, there are some, some kind of easy things, like uh, for example, they, they, uh, they press fire always after resetting the environment so the agent doesn't have to learn. Some, some games, they don't start at if, if you don't press fire, for example. So they, instead of having the agent learn that, they saved some time by just, after reset, they always do that. So you can, for example, imagine a wrapper that does that. This is how everything is implemented now. Um, this is also an important one. After a life is lost in the game, they cut the episode short. Okay. So you you basically your agent is trying not to die in the in the game. Okay. He doesn't uh, he doesn't know we can reach uh, another life. Okay. Um, now, another, another really crucial issue here is that they fuse together adjacent frames because in, in these Atari games, there, there's lots of flickering because it, 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 there's a limited number of entities that the game can show at, at a single frame. So they kind of flicker between entities. So sometimes the entities disappear and stuff like that. So they're just taking a max value. Um, they're scaling the frames to a consistent size and uh, just using grayscale, throwing away the colors. In a, in a specific way. They do some kind of specific transform for grayscale. Um, 
they skip frames, in this case, and more importantly, they stack together frames after skipping. So this, this is a really crucial issue. If you, for example, think about it, if you look at a single frame, and then it's really hard to understand any dynamics. You don't know like wh wh what's moving where. Okay, so if you have, uh, imagine, uh, yeah, imagine a game, the game of Pong, where you have uh, these pedals, so you need to really know if, if the ball is going toward you or toward your opponent. So after skipping k frames, they also stack m frames, and the input to the network will be m consecutive frames. And that way, from these frames, you can, you can identify the dynamics. You can see, for example, where, where things are moving. And they move pretty fast because you also skipped. Okay, so you, you skip and you stack. And they also they clip the reward. For some reason, they say that it helps convergence. So this is just a graphical representation. We, we skip four, but we use the third one and the fourth one for max, for the max operation. And then we take, uh, we take a stack of these of four, four uh, pairs like that. So that's what, what our actual observations will be in the, in the model. So luckily, we don't have to implement everything ourselves. Since uh, this is a very famous paper, there's an implementation of all, all, these, uh, all these things as wrappers. You can see it in, the, in a, a link I give here. It's uh, called uh, Baselines by OpenAI. It's a repo with uh, implementations of lots of RL-related uh, things. And specifically, they give you a gym wrapper for each of these. OK, so I just use that. And uh, the only thing we'll add is just our custom wrapper to convert the images into a PyTorch uh, access ordering. So this is my uh, channel height width image wrapper. It takes, uh, it just takes your uh, your observation and s flips the axis, so the the channels are in the beginning, which is the convention in Py in PyTorch which, where for convolution layers. Okay. I can show you if you want to see the the actual Atari wrappers. I put them. I put them next to the Python notebook. You can see Atari wrappers.py. I took it from here. Okay, you can see, for example, all these wrappers like fire reset env and episode life env. So these are all wrappers that create these these pre-processing steps that I talked about. Okay, so what I'm doing here, I'm uh, defining my own make Atari. I'm uh, applying all the wrappers from that uh, package that I got from OpenAI. Okay, I'm just applying everything, and then I'm applying my own wrapper and creating an environment. Let's see what we got. Okay, so you can see now, we have this very heavily wrapped thing. We have uh, Space Invaders No Frame Skip, wrapped by Atari, wrapped by Time Limit, wrapped by no op reset, wrapped by max and skip, wrapped by uh, episode life, and uh, also this, for example, this one warp frame is what converts to grayscale and uh, and uh, rescales to 84 by 84. So we have a bunch of these wrappers over our environment, and we're just going to use that instance. So okay, so this is why these wrappers are a useful concept to to understand and use. Okay, so now all our pre-processing is done. We have. As you can see, we have now four channels, 84 by 84. So it's not color channels anymore. It's four consecutive frames after skipping four. So we have skipping four, then we're taking four consecutive of those skips. So now our, our agent will see this uh, tensor, which instead of channels, will have uh, the, these frames showing the dynamics, for example, movement directions and stuff like that. OK, now we can actually do some some deep learning. So first of all, the model from the paper, it's uh, very, very simple compared to other models that we saw already. It just has three conv layers and then three fully connected layers. No fancy tricks, nothing. The input is a state. And again, now the state is 4 by 84 by 84. It's this tensor. And the output is a score for each possible action. So if we have six actions, then we only have we have a six uh, six element tensor output. Okay, so the function is actually it, it it's not that we're giving it a state and an action and it's giving us a number. We're giving it a state and it's giving us the number for each action. Okay, so it's, it's still the Q value function though. 
It just saves us, saves us forward passes because we do one forward pass and we get all the action values. Okay, so that's our model. So by now, this should be super trivial for you. Okay, just a module with, with a, a conv part, three convs with ReLU, and then a sequential part with two uh, FCs. That's it. Okay, and uh, this, this, this middle part that calculates the number of uh, con features. That's it. Okay. Forward, take the conv features, flatten them, and put it in the fully connected, and then you get your final class scores. Okay, nothing fancy, nothing interesting. Let's just see it in action. So this is our model. We, have, uh, we take the observation that we saw before, which was 4 by 84 by 84 put it in our model and we get six uh, numbers which represent the score or the action, um, the action value for each of the possible six actions. Okay, good. So we have a model. Next thing we need to implement is the replay buffer. So, it's also, this is a very simple implementation. All it does is basically gives you this append here, okay? And uh, you, you just define a max len. I'm using, a, using something called a DQ, which is a, a data structure that just lets you, uh, lets you insert efficiently from each side. In this case, if you say max len, you can insert into one side, and it will automatically kind of do the sliding window part. So all I'm doing here in the, in the append, I'm getting the state action reward is done so, I, so that I know if it's terminal state and the next state, the new state. Okay, so. That's what I'm just getting. All I'm doing is appending a tuple with these things. Just a small uh, nuance here is that I'm, I'm moving the, the, these are numbers, action reward is done, these are just numbers or, or a boolean, but this is a tensor. I'm moving it to, to CPU so I don't kind of have uh, insane, if my buffer is really huge, then I'm keeping everything in the GPU memory. Might run out, which happened. And uh, to sample, all I'm doing is I'm taking I'm getting some batch size. I'm selecting randomly uh, integers representing indices in my buffer. Okay, and then I'm just taking the buffer in those indices and uh, un kind of zipping it so I get batches of the state, action, reward, is done, and next state. Finally, I'm just returning it as tensors. Okay, so that's all I'm doing. So I get a batch here of, of, of the... Of state images, the actions that were performed for each image, the reward that we got, whether it's whether we reach the terminal state and the next state that we got to. So this is our replay buffer. Now our agent. Okay, so agent. We first of all we're working with our environment. QNet is the network or our DQN model. And we have this replay buffer, so we can actually uh, we can store our experiences in it. What we the main thing that we have to implement for agent is our step. This is what the agent will do. Um, every every step that we that we work with it. So for, first of all, we have this epsilon greedy thing. So with probability epsilon, we take a random random sample from our action space. This is what we saw before. This is what we did all the time. But now with uh, the other part of the, the 1 minus epsilon, we do this part, which is take our current state. Sorry, I should have showed that. I Initially, I reset the env and wrap the first initial observation, store it in a current state. Okay, so I have my current state. I'm using the current state here, I'm forward passing it through my Q network and getting the action value for all the actions. Remember, it's a, it's a tensor with number of actions. Okay. Then I'm selecting the maximal action. Okay, that's our policy. Remember, we take the, the action with maximal value. That's our policy. So I'm going over dimension one, looking at all the action values and taking the maximal one. This is my action just uh, converting it to an integer, and then I can apply it to my environment. By the way, why, why am I doing this no grad? Any ideas? Uh, 
because yes, I'm. This is like inference. This part. I don't. I'm not training here. I'm just collecting experiences. So I don't need to waste time and create and track gradients and create my my uh, computation graph. So I'm not wasting time on that. I'm just I'm just running through my current model to get my current action values for this state. Okay, so after I, after I have my action, whether it was random or not, I'm putting it in my environment, I'm getting my next state and reward based on that. Um, I'm ignoring the extra info, it's not relevant for learning, but remember that it is used by one of the wrappers, the wrappers that cuts the episodes after, after each life is lost, it's actually looking at this extra info and deciding whether to return is done. Okay, so that's one of the wrappers that we got from OpenAI and we're not implementing it ourselves here. Good, so after we got this uh, next state and reward, we're accumulating our current episode reward. We're adding to our, uh, to our replay buffer the current state, the action we did, which is what we selected here, reward we got, whether it's done, and the next state that we got from our environment. Current state is next state now. Okay, and simply if, if, we, if we're done, then it means that this episode is finished. So if the episode is finished, we return the final reward for the episode. That's it. Okay, so that's our whole agent implementation. Let's just try it. So I'm just creating a, a, a simple agent here and running it for some steps with uh, epsilon 0.5. So it's using the model sometimes. Just want to see that it, it works. I'm getting I'm getting a. I'm looking at its current state and uh, accumulating reward. Okay, so it seems like it's working. If I look at my replay buffer for a second, I just want to sample a batch of two. Okay, and then I want to I want to look at the shapes and uh, the d-types. I can see this is my current state batch. So we have batch of two and four eighty four eighty four. So this is the the frames four frames. This, this is my actions, I have two actions and two rewards and two is done values and then, then two next states. Okay, so everything makes sense in terms of dimensions. Always check dimensions, it's kind of uh, crucial. Okay, so now the actual meat of the, meat of the issue here, our loss function. So remember, our loss function here now has to, to create, to, to have some kind of labels that we generate based on the, the target network. Okay, so let's look at the, the loss. Here I'm using, uh, I'm taking, I need both the QNet and the target net. And my forward pass will take a batch, okay, from my experience buffer of the same, the same tuple. Okay, so now I have two parts here. The first part, I need to calculate my predicted action value. So I'm taking my current state through my Q network, this time with gradients. Okay, this time I'm using the Q network with gradients. I'm getting the action value for each of the possible actions. And then I'm, I'm using this, this gather thing. So what, what this is doing is, remember I'm getting the, the action value here for all possible actions in the batch of states. Okay, so I have this, uh, I have, I have many, many possible actions for, for each state. But, but one, only one, of, one action was actually selected by my agent for this experience. So what I need to do is for each, each of those states, select the action that was actually selected by my agent. Okay, so what, what this is doing is taking, taking the indices in dimension one according to the action. Okay, so if, for example, if in the first, the first experience here, the action was zero, then it will take the zeroth value of the first row in my QS. Okay, maybe I can draw it for, for a second. So if, so my, my QS is uh, kind of, so, so this is my batch dimension, and this is the, the action values, okay? So these are action values, and I have this A, the, the action, so it's also a batch of N, Okay, so let's say the, for the first experience it was action 0 and the second experience it was action 1. So I want to take this, this, this uh, action value and I want to take this action value. 
And if, if here it's uh, 5, then I want to take this action value. Okay, got it? And again, this is differentiable. So I just I take these values, okay? And this is what I will back, back prop through. I will update the parameters that influence these values. So this gather operation is differentiable, and I, we need that, okay? So now we have our predictions. After we have our predictions, we need labels. So we're taking our target network, applying, applying the next state to that network. Okay, again, we, this is inference. We don't care about calculating gradients, so we don't need a computation graph. Saving some time by doing this. Now, again, we get the same kind of tensor of action values for each of the next states. Now we select the maximal action that we got. This is our max part. And we set to zero if it was done, if, if it was a terminal state. So we use the batch, of, the batch of these as a logical index. We use it as a logical index. So if it was a terminal state, we just say it was zero here. That way, our targets, our predictions are just the reward that we got for each experience plus gamma times this uh, prediction after zeroing. Because if you look at the formula, for terminal states, we just take the reward, and for non-terminal states, we take the reward plus the maximal action of the Q function for the next state. So this is the implementation. Finally, after we have our prediction and target SA values, we calculate an MSE loss. That's it. Okay. After we have that, then all we have to do is train. So I'm not going to go into this. This is just parameters. Most of them I took from the paper. It takes a long, really long time to train this. I think it takes a, a few million, uh, few million steps. I think for most games, I'm not sure. Um, remember, so this is the uh, the training code. The only interesting part that I really want to show here is um, okay. So there are a few parts, but I have to. I can't see it like that. Just a sec. Okay, so briefly, our training loop is is slightly different than, than the usual one. So the first thing we, that we're doing here is uh, having this epsilon value that we need to decay. So we have, uh, we have a final value that we need to reach and a start value and just linearly decay it over the steps that we're doing. Okay, so we're running our agent each step. If the reward is not none, it means that the episode is over. Okay, so all we're doing is uh, doing some bookkeeping here. Um, nothing interesting here, but here are the few interesting points that, first of all, we until we reach some kind of initial length of the buffer, we don't actually train. We just keep we just continue here, so keep running the agent. So basically, until our replay buffer is large enough, we just accumulate experiences using our agent. So every time we step, our buffer gets another experience from the agent. And again, initially, epsilon is one, so we get initially lots of random experiences. The next part here is that every sync target steps number of steps so this is, uh, I think it's 10,000 or something like that. We take our target network and copy parameters from our actual training network. So this is, this is the bootstrapping thing. Okay, this is what syncs between networks. So this copies, copies the parameters from the QNet to the QTarget net. And the actual training happens here. So we, we, bat, we take a batch size from our replay buffer, pass the batch to the loss function that we saw before that calculates the, the prediction and the labels, gives, gets us an MSE loss, we do backwards, so we're actually backpropping through the whole thing, going through all of these elements that we selected from our prediction, and finally doing the step which will actually ac update the parameters of our QNet. And just the QNet. Okay, so that's I think the whole the whole implementation of the training. I, I did some evaluation uh, function here just 
so when, when we update the model parameters, I'm uh, running this evaluation code, which just uh, gives, gives a short video of, the, of a current episode, just to see if the model is improving. It's not really relevant now. And finally, the, the, this is the code that actually runs it. Very simple, like you saw, it just creates the environment, creates the QNet and target net and replay buffer and agent based on everything that we saw, the loss that we implemented, optimizer that they're using RMS prop in this paper, and running the function that we saw previously to do the whole training thing. So I'm not really going to train, obviously. It will take uh, probably a day or something. Just showing you that it, it runs, so it should run for a few uh, few episodes, and then stop. Okay. Okay, so it, it ran for fifty episodes, and then stop. You can see it decayed epsilon slightly. Okay. So that's it. That's the whole implementation. You can see it's not, not very long. The actual results, not mine from the paper, but this exact model. They use the same exact model for all the Atari games. And really, for most of them, they got superhuman performance. 100% here is the level of a professional human. So if they got, for example, in Space Invaders, 121%, and it's 21% higher average higher score than a very, very skilled human. That's what they got, uh, for example, in this game. And again, the same model for, they trained the same model for all these games. Okay, and uh, they also show a, a cool uh, visualization of the embeddings that are created. Um, but I don't think you can see anything like this, but for example, they, they show that uh, this, the colors here are the value function that, uh, that's computed by the, the model after it trained for a very long time. And you can see that it, it kind of determines uh, interesting things. Um, for example, it gives, does, it doesn't really care, for example, about the, the orange uh, shield that the, there are. It gives them the same value regardless, doesn't really use them. And if there, if there are no, uh, no enemies left, it knows that uh, a screen of new enemies will appear, so it, it also has a high value, just like this case of a full screen. So it knows that it can play well now after lots of training. So if there are lots of enemies on the screen, it has a high value. But if there are very few, it also has a high value, because in the next step, it will, for, for example, shoot the last enemy, and then it will get the screen full of more enemies. So even though these are different in the embedding space, they both have almost maximal value. Okay, so just to, to recap, we saw in this uh, implementation very kind of key, key ideas in, uh, in reinforcement learning. We implemented agent environments. Uh, we, we used the, the formalism of the Bellman equation. And we even, even uh, used some tricks like, um, like stacking and, um, and replay buffer and stuff like that. But again, if you, if you want to see really uh, something that's more close to the state of the art, there's a more recent paper from 2017 where they do, I think, I think it was seven different tricks, for example, giving priorities to the replay buffer and using two deep Q networks together and lots of lots of tricks and they got much better results. The same, it's, a, it's also from DeepMind. So I have a link here and uh, I think that's it. I'll leave you with this quote for, as a conclusion. Thanks.